One very obvious thing that we notice is that all the early civilizations don't still exist. Whether we look at the Mayas, the Aztecs, the Egyptians, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the, they, they all collapsed. And so the precedent is actually that civilization collapses, not that it maintains. The real difference is that this is the first time we have a completely global civilization. There really is no such thing as USA or China separate from each other when you understand globalized materials economies, technology, economics, where there's actually no country in the world that can make its own consumer electronics, right, without the mining and manufacturing and, you know, technology that happens from around the world. So our process of civilization is one that has inherently self-terminating dynamics built into it. When that happens at a fully global scale, it is a, basically the catastrophe is just unbounded, where it has always been bounded. As big as the Roman Empire was when it fell, it wasn't everything. And limited by not only its total geographical size, but the level of technology it had, it caused desertification through unrenewable agriculture, but it wasn't able to destabilize the biosphere writ large. In 100 years of industrialized fishing, we've removed most of the large fish species from a water planet, right? A three-quarter water planet it took three and a half billion years to get those fish species. And so you recognize that we're operating the same way that has always led to war and environmental destruction and collapse of civilization, just factoring exponential technology. And so when you start to think about exponential rivalry, rivalrous dynamics that lead to polarization that ends up leading to war, but now exponential warfare, it becomes larger than a finite biosphere can handle and it becomes existential. When you think about exponential extraction and exponential pollution, which means depletion and accumulation from open loops in a network diagram, you go to an ecosystem, there are no open loops. Everything is the food for something else. There is no unrenewable resource, no waste. Our civilization is characterized by a materials economy that's linear, not circular. So toxicity is depletion on one side, accumulation on the other. Whether we're talking about on the depletion side, whether we're talking about species extinction or biodiversity loss or um, any of the issues that we look at there and on the accumulation side, whether we're talking about CO2 levels in the air or in the water or nitrogen runoff or degraded uranium or whatever else it is, those are all specific instantiations of open loops in the way we do civilization in relationship to the closed loop dynamics of the ecosystem that both have a civilization that is increasingly fragile and that is making an increasingly fragile underlying ecosystem. It is basically debasing the substrate upon which it depends. And so when you think about exponential extraction, exponential pollution, that obviously gets larger than the playing field can handle. When you try and think about exponential expansion of the monetary supply that has to be based in goods and services, that can't keep happening. When you think about we compete using narrative and information, when you start to think about exponential information tech used for disinformation, and for population control, you get to a place where the information ecology is so broken that what's actually happening with North Korea or not, are we gonna have nuclear war? What's actually happening with Syria? What's actually happening with Putin's relationship to the Trump administration? How long do we really have before all the coral die off? Like all the most important questions as to whether we make it or not as a species, nobody really knows how to make sense of. And so, when you have a situation where you've actually got an exponentially decreasing sense-making capacity, right, an information ecology that is increasingly more broken, with an exponentially increasing capacity to make big choices, right? The technology is basically a lever of our choice making. So a fist has one level of harm. When I extend that to a stone tool, it's a bigger harm to a bronze tool, to a gun. At the level of an ICBM, there's just a really big extension of that type of choice making capacity. But when I have exponentially increased choice making capacity with exponentially worse sense making, that always runs into a cliff. And so the underlying dynamics that are leading to the self-termination that people feel and sense right now are not different in kind than the ones that we've been facing since the beginning of what we call civilization. They're different in magnitude and in the speed of process factoring the exponential curves involved. And what is, because some people talk about the shift being, we, we can talk about it in terms of material terms, or we can talk about it in terms of, a, of an evolution in, in consciousness or the way that we operate. What do you sense is that leap that we need to make in terms of how we operate? You actually have to think about it on all of those levels to be able to make sense of it. 
in a meaningful way. Otherwise, it's kind of like asking when we are talking about the health of a person, whether that means the health of their liver or their kidneys or their blood. It's like the, that doesn't even make sense. You can't separate those things from each other. So when I think about what economics is, economics is our value system codified as value equations that determines how much we value one thing relative to another thing that determines what we're incentivized to do and what we confer power to. So if a dead whale is worth a million dollars on a fishing boat and a live whale in the ocean is worth nothing, that's a value system codified in a value equation that then incentivizes behavior, but it also incentivizes psychopathology, right? Psychopathy, actually. I have to shut empathy down because leaving the whale in the ocean it actually isn't even going to stay in the ocean. Another guy's going to hunt it out, right? So I've got a tragedy of the common, so I have to kind of deaden to be able to do the thing that is incentivized by the system. Or somebody else does, and I'm just not effective in the system. So you can't think about the evolution of human consciousness and the evolution of economics differently. If you look at the way economics then needs to protect its own profit stream and the way it will learn how to influence media to control people's sense-making frameworks and the way it will influence governance, Again, this is getting to consciousness, or the way it will influence legislation on the nature of what happens in education to prepare people for the workforce. And so um, the paradigm shift is basically everything. We need new systems of governance. If we just, I mean, we think about how much we love the word democracy. And we love the word democracy because uh, it's better than tyranny. Um, and it's better than the other like really horrible systems that we've experienced at any scale. But when Winston Churchill said democracy is the single worst form of governance ever created, save for all the other forms, what he was saying that was really insightful was that getting lots of humans to agree on anything is just a hard thing to do and we suck at it. And we've never actually done a good job at it. And this is a really flawed system. Now, we like it because, like we said, it's overcoming things that were even more problematic. But if you think about democracy for a moment. And whether we're talking representative democracy or liquid democracy using a voting currency or binary vote, fundamentally you have a process of saying, okay, we can't get everybody to agree beyond a very small number of people. Dunbar number, tribe, you can get everybody to agree because they can all be in a conversation together. Beyond the level at which you can have a conversation together, you can have a few people control everything and they can be in a conversation together, some type of oligarchy or meritocracy. But then you're like, no, we want most of the people to agree at least, right? That seems like a good idea. But somebody puts forward a proposition to do something that they think is important based on their limited sense making that is never everything. That proposition, because it wasn't informed by comprehensive sense making, will always, in the process of benefiting something, also damage something else. And so some people love it based on if what it's benefiting is directly relevant to them, and other people hate it based on if what it's damaging is relevant to them. You just created inexorable polarization because you made shitty propositions and then asked people to vote yes or no binary on a shitty proposition. So you notice people actually all, don't all get to contribute to the sense making of what a good proposition would be. There's no kind of collective input there. There isn't even a generation of what would go good mean here. And they, so really even their choice making is just yes or no on a frame that was already controlled. And typically who's going to be able to even put forward a proposition is someone who has vested interests. And so you're stuck with polarization in that particular system, right? So we need new systems of governance that are not any system of governance the world has ever done so far. They are systems of how do we individually and collectively make sense of what's going on, make sense of what we actually value and how those values can be synergistically satisfied rather than in a theory of trade-offs with each other, progressively better, and how do we create design that are optimal synergistic satisfiers. So that's totally new thing, governance-wise. We need totally new systems of economics, we need totally new systems of education, healthcare, all the way down to, at an individual level, a new basis for identity values our own individual sense-making, choice-making. As long as I think that I'm an individual that is fundamentally separate from you and the biosphere and everything else, I can think about optimizing my own quality of life independent of and maybe even at the expense of your quality of life or the biosphere or anything else. As soon as I get that, I start to say, okay, well, I'm not that tree, but what would I be without trees? Well, I would not exist, right? Well, there would be no atmosphere if there weren't plants photosynthesizing. So I fundamentally am not even a meaningful concept without plants. So if I think of myself as me that is not fundamentally interdependent with plants, I'm actually just not even thinking clearly, right? It's just a bad ontology. It's a bad semiotics. 
And then I start to run that and say, well, what about soil microbiota? And what about, and it turns out that my life depends on the whole thing, right? So I am really, I can be better thought of as an emergent property of this whole thing, right? Not just the biosphere, because what would it be without the sun? And so as long as I have a sense of I that is separate and maybe even rivalrous, in rivalrous competition for some scarce status, resource, attention, partner, whatever it is, um, then we have a fundamental basis for war. And in a world of exponentially increasing technology, which means that the warfare gets to be more and more consequential, that will self-terminate. So rival risk dynamics multiplied by exponential tech self-terminate. Exponential tech is inexorable. We cannot put it away. So we either figure out anti-rivalry or we go extinct. The human experiment comes to a completion. That's like, that's the core thing. Figuring out anti-rivalry is a psycho-spiritual process inside of ourselves. Can we actually even get along with our family members? Can we pay attention to our emotions and triggers that hijack us from sovereignty? Because the moment I'm getting pissed and my value system is not to be an angry person, I'm actually hijacked, right? Can I pay attention to that and actually have some sovereignty over my own inner state and how I show up in the world? And can we figure out how to do that collectively as well?